Hello, and welcome to Vector Graphics. Today, we'll be covering the very basics. First, we'll talk about vector graphics at a high level, then see how vector images are defined, and finally, we'll develop an algorithm to fill simple shapes like these. All right, so what is vector graphics? Vector graphics is a way of defining 2D images just like this one. Except this one is not vector graphics, which you can tell by zooming in, and then you can see it is made out of pixels which have discrete color values. Vector graphics, on the other hand, is a way of defining images in a more mathematical way, where if you zoom in, you still get the shapes in the same sharpness as when zoomed out. Let's look at some other examples of vector graphics images and then get a feeling for how they're defined. So this is the classical tiger, which you might have seen before. This is a map of Paris, which is also, also defined by vector graphics, which means you can zoom in and the fidelity is retained, except Firefox is a bit slow. So zooming in takes a while. This is a map of Hawaii. This is something you might not expect vector graphics to be able to define because it has these like smooth color transitions. And you can also do stuff like this car, which also, like if you squint a little, it look, kind of looks realistic. That's what you can do with vector graphics. Now let's see how these things are defined. Let's start with the tiger because that's relatively simple. And we'll just zoom in on the tooth down here. And because this is an SVG, which we've opened in the browser, we can right click inspect element to see what's going on. So if we copy this string right here, that is how this shape is defined. And we can put it into this inspector tool. And you can see, okay, there appear to be like some things that make up this kind of shape. So that's what it means that we define the shapes, the, the parts of the image in a more mathematical way. But now let's look at this thing around the tooth, this outline. If we inspect that element, we can see it's just the path right below it. We take that and we put it into the editor, and we can see, well, it looks just the same. But if we look at the image, then we can see that the first path, it is filled, so it has a solid color on the inside, and the second path is just an outline. So what's the difference? Well, one of them is filled and the other one is stroked. Filling means that you take the shape and then you just kind of fill it in like you would if you were to first draw an outline on a piece of paper and then fill it in. Stroking on the other hand would be drawing the outline by following it with a pen or pencil. So these are how basic shapes are defined. We can define a curve and then we can say please fill it or please draw the outline by stroking it. Now let's see what's going on with these images which clearly don't just have a simple fill or a simple stroke. If we zoom in on the black part of the, what's that, of that drop right there, we can see, well, it kind of just looks the same. In fact, it's just an ellipse type shape, which also has a fill. But in this case, the fill is a link to a different definition, which is up here in the definitions. And we can see there's a bunch of definitions just like that one which are radial gradients. So the drop is also just filled with a color, except there is a function which for every pixel computes a color. And it just happens to be defined so that things on the edge of the drop get a darkish value. And as you go towards the middle, it gets lighter. And the same thing which is with the drops is also going on with the car where these reflections here, they use radial gradients or other types of gradients in order to fill the shapes in a way which makes them look like they have more fidelity to them just like a shader would make a mesh or something look more detailed in a 3D engine. All right, now let's try to answer the question what it means to fill a path, just fill the inside. Well, the question is now, what is the inside? It is pretty easy to answer what is not inside the shape because we can just like draw a box around the shape, which we can do by looking at all of the extreme points and, and drawing a box around that. And everything that's not inside this box is outside of the shape for sure. So now for points inside of the rectangle, what determines whether it is inside or outside of the shape? Well, we can do something like starting just outside of the rectangle and then drawing a line to the point that we want to determine whether it's inside or not. So if you want to determine whether this point is inside the shape or not, you can kind of go to the left here and we know that point is outside of the shape and draw a line to the point and then see if we ignore this box, do we cross the, the outline or not? And then we can see in this case, yes, there is an intersection. So therefore this point is inside. Now, if we try to kind of apply the same rule for this point, then we start outside of the shape. We do not cross 
the curve, so this point is outside of the shape. Oh, but what about this point? So if we draw the line, then we can see if we draw the line starting from the right side, then we do not cross the shape. But if we start from the left side, then we cross the shape twice. So here we're outside, then we cross it, then we're inside. And the interesting thing is now when we cross it again, then we're outside of the shape again. And this happens to work out for every single direction you might choose. In fact, it works out for every single path, I'm pretty sure. So we could start somewhere out here, which is outside, then do some kind of crazy dance and then determine whether this point is inside of the shape or not. And if we kind of follow this path we've drawn and then we can see inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, right? And therefore the point is inside. All right, now let's look at a different shape and see if that rule still works. In the case of this shape, if we just do a fill, this is kind of what we would expect. Now let's see if that works if we apply our rule. So we start outside, we want to determine is this point inside, so we draw our line, and we can see we cross the shape once, and therefore this point is inside, and if we do it for a point here, then we can see we cross it twice, therefore it is not inside. And if we come from the top, then we don't intersect the shape at all, and therefore it is still outside. And in fact, this still works, even if you don't know what this top part looks like. So if I draw a rectangle on top and fill it so you can't see what's going on, and you just apply the rule of how often do I intersect the shape, then you can still determine that this is in fact not inside the shape. So that gets us to an interesting thing we can do, which is actually using multiple curves to define a shape. So if you kind of think about what's going on here, we have an outer shape, which kind of defines an ellipse type shape. Then we can use other paths or like sub paths to cut holes in it. All right, so let's look at an example of cutting holes in shapes in a real SVG. So I've selected this house down here in the inspector. And if we copy the path and look at it in the SVG inspector, we can see that it in fact has an outline and then it has a hole cut into it. And if we delete this path, we can see that in fact, this is what's going on. We have an outline and we cut a hole into it. So we now have a rule to determine whether a point is inside the shape or not. Start outside of the shape, draw a line, count how often you cross the curve. If that's an odd number, you're inside. If it's an even number, you're outside. But that rule has a little bit of a problem. If we look at this eight, which I've defined by just having two curves, if we look at this section of the eight and we apply our rule, then we have one, two intersections. So in fact, if we used our rule to fill the eight, it would actually look like this. But what we might expect is this. So now let's look at something called winding and a different rule, which does not have this problem. So the problem was that we had two cases where there were two intersections, but we wanted to actually treat them differently. Up here, we wanted to be outside, inside, outside. And down here, we wanted to be outside, inside, inside. So we'll need to find some way to differentiate between these two cases. We can do that by assigning directions to the paths. Here I've made them go in opposite directions. This is what the first path looks like and the second. If we now analyze what's going on, we can see in the top case we have down and up, and in the bottom case we have down and down. So we seem to have found a solution, but it's not very concrete yet. Previously we just tracked whether we were inside or outside of the shape. So outside, inside, outside. Now let's instead have a number. We'll start at zero. Whenever a path goes down, we'll add one. So here we have one. When it goes up, we'll subtract one. So now we have a zero here again. It goes down, have a one. It goes up, have a zero. Now let's see what's going on in the middle. We'll start at zero, then it goes down. So we have one, then it goes down again. So we have a two, then it goes up. So we have one, and it goes up again. So we have zero again. So if we fill whenever the number is not zero, then we actually get what we want because two is not zero. So when using the numbers, we can actually implement the old rule, which is called the even odd fill rule, because you fill the path whenever you have an odd number, or we can use the new rule, which is called the non-zero rule, which fills whenever the number is not zero. And we can get both behaviors, having the middle filled or not. And this number, which we add one or subtract one from each time we have an intersection, is called the winding. All right, so we can now design an algorithm to fill a shape. Filling a shape means determining which pixels are inside or outside of the shape. But we'll just kind of flip the problem around and for every single pixel on the screen, determine whether it's inside or not. To do that, we'll compute the winding. And if the winding matches the fill rule, we know that we have to fill the pixel. 
But there is one tiny problem, which is that computing the winding is something we can do for a point. But a pixel isn't just a single point, a pixel is a rectangle on the screen. But we can just choose the center. So as an example, this pixel down here, its center is inside of the shape and so it gets filled. The pixel above it, its center is just outside of the shape so it doesn't get filled. But these two, they're inside again and so they get filled. If you apply this algorithm to the entire shape, we get this. But as you can see, by only considering the center of each pixel, we get a very pixelated image of the triangle. There are ways to fix that, and that's generally called anti-aliasing, and I might talk about that in the future. But for now, let's try to implement this algorithm. The implementation is pretty straightforward. First, we need a way to define points. To do that, we use a vector 2, which consists of an x and a y component. Using two vectors, we can define a line. Using a list of lines, we can define a path. We now have a width, a height, and a fill rule, we have enough to rasterize a path. Rasterize meaning turn into pixels. To turn the path into pixels, we iterate over all pixels in the rectangle defined by the width and the height. In this case, rendering is implemented by printing to the console. For every pixel and every row, we print either a hash symbol or a dot, depending on whether the pixel is filled or not. At the end of the row, we print a new line to get to the next line. To determine whether the pixel is filled, we first have to compute the winding. Remember to add 0.5 to each coordinate to compute the winding at the center of the pixel. Depending on the fill rule, we can then determine if the pixel is filled. If we're using the non-zero rule, the winding has to be not zero. If we're using the even-odd rule, the winding has to be odd. Next, let's talk about how we compute the winding. Remember, to compute the winding at a point, we have to start somewhere outside of the shape, draw a line to that point, and for every intersection along the path, adjust the winding, depending on whether the path goes up or down. Instead of computing some point which is outside of the shape, let's just use the point at negative x infinity, because that's definitely outside of the shape. That's just another way of saying, let's start at the point and trace a ray to the left. As you can see, this works just fine. As the path consists of multiple line segments, we can break the problem down into ray versus line segment. And we can break that problem down into first computing the intersections between the infinite lines defined by the ray and the line segments, and then checking whether those intersections are actually on the ray and on the line segments. In this case, they're on the line segments, but not on the ray. And up here, they would be on the ray, but not on the line segments. In the code, we first define the ray, which starts at the point we're given, and extends towards the left. We then define the winding and initialize it to zero, and eventually return it. Then, for every line in the path, compute the intersection between the ray and the infinite line. We're given the parameters for the ray and the line where the intersection occurred. The ray is hit if the parameter is greater than or equal to 0, and the segment is hit if the parameter is greater than or equal to 0, and is less than or equal to 1. If both the ray and the segment are hit, we can compute the delta winding and add it to the winding. And that's enough to implement your first vector renderer. Here's an example of drawing the 8 with the even odd and the non-zero fill rule. But obviously there's a lot more that goes into a real vector renderer, like stroking, shaders, and composition. And I've also intentionally kept this implementation very simple. That has a few bad consequences, like being terribly inefficient, and sometimes having bugs when a line segment ends in the middle of a pixel. I'll probably address some of those things as well as anti-aliasing and curved paths in the future. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching.